Hey everybody, thanks for coming out tonight. Nice to see you all, nice to be here. Very special. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Roland. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start at the beginning of your, of your career. Um, at what age did you realise that you wanted to pursue a career in music and were there kind of other options on the cards alongside music? Yeah, I, I, I mean, in Ireland, I, I, I came from a working class family. Um, football, Gaelic football in particular, was very, very important to, to our household. And athletics, and my brother was a very good 400 meter runner and he went on a, a scholarship to America uh, to become an athlete and, and better himself and study also. And he was on the, the east coast of America and I kind of, that was kind of the thing I wanted to do. I was into sprinting, uh, athletics, I was okay at it. Uh, at the age of 13 and 14, I was the fastest in the country, over 200 metres. Um, and I thought that's what I was going to do. That was it for me. I thought I was going to be a sprinter. I was going to follow my brother, Jer, and we were going to, I was going to, yeah, pursue that. And I was in a few school bands at the time. 13, 14, 15, you know, one band in particular, we did okay. Our, the name of the band was Namaste. We took it from the 10th. 10th track on a Beastie Boys album, that's where the name came from, and we, um, we did really well, we won quite a lot of Battle of the Band type gigs, and I thought that became more and more important to me than running. And then I was working part time in a shoe shop in Dublin, because I was still at school, and there was an advert in the newspaper about the Irish answer to take that. And there was no pop music in Ireland at all. It was all rock bands, U2, Thin Lizzy, lots of great rock bands and alternate music, but no pop music as such. So this was like, this was amazing for me because I was into, you know, pop music. I was into, you know, when I was growing up, it was about Wham, George Michael, you know, pop music very much. So, uh, so this was a real, oh my God, you know, for, for a band like this to come out of Ireland, this would be everything I've ever wanted. So I went for the audition. I remember turning up in Dublin, uh, it was a, a Thursday night. I was working late in, in the shoe shop, Thursday night, late opening. <laughs> and I went around the corner to a place on the Liffey called the Ormond Key Building. And there was 300 guys, roughly 300 guys there auditioning. And uh, Colin Farrell was one of them, the actor, now actor, very successful uh, actor and many, many other faces, obviously the four other lads from Boyzone. Um, but I remember seeing all these people thinking, oh my God, I will never get in this band. I don't look like as good as, I don't look as good as them. And we all had to separately go into this room and sing and, and so on. And I got asked to come back a week later. And that was, an, uh, you know, after that, I got asked to come back another week later and I got whittled down week after week to finally been picked for the band and then everything just kind of happened it was crazy but I didn't think it was going to be music when I was 12 13 14 I love music but I didn't think that was going to be what I did I knew I wasn't a rock star but I, I thought I could be a pop star and it happened and did you think that any of the skills or any of the experiences from kind of athletics or um, working in the shoe shop, do, did any of those help you in your career? Well, I think working in the shoe shop, athletics didn't help me. I mean, it kept me, no, at all. <laughs> did nothing for me. Um, but I guess the um, dealing with people, you know, from a young age, I started working part time at 14. My dad always believed in, in hard work. You know, he, 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 he trained football teams as well as um, other things, but he, you know, you know, as, you know, for fun more than anything else, he would train the local football team, the GAA team. And he always believed that the lad who trained the hardest would get his game on a Sunday. And I think that kind of message was passed on to all of his children. We believed in hard work and graft. And, and it was that that really, you know, ha has driven me for, well, since I joined the band 26 years ago. I am... Um, yeah, I, so I, I would work part time in a shoe shop, you know, to make a few quid and work, you know, on the time I had off. And, and, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, that helped me a lot dealing with people. You know, the, you know, it was a rough part of town where the shoe shop was, a rough part of Dublin. Lads had come in out of their heads on heroin 
you know, and they'd make, they'd try and make deals with me. I remember this one guy used to come in all the time and he used to wear glasses with no glass in them. And he'd be off his face, he'd be in scratching his face. All right, man, what's happening? You know, you wouldn't steal those shoes from me. And I was shitting myself thinking this guy could stick a syringe in me. I'm 14 years of age. I was so, I was, you know, scared. But it, it, it kind of set me up for, you know, not him personally, but all of the experiences working in that shoe shop, shoe, shoe shop on the floor, dealing with people in Dublin. You know, the salt of the earth, brilliant people. Helped me to be able to walk into that room and sing a song with confidence and, and talk to the people that were in the room. And then from there, you know, even though I was the youngest member of the band, I think I probably had one of the, you know, the oldest heads as such. Mm -hmm. um, and you said you joined Boyzone around the age of 16. Yeah. Um, what was it like being thrown into this professional music career straight into the spotlight after what you've described as quite humble working class beginnings? Was it a contrast you found difficult? Not really. We, the first year we travelled around Ireland in a, a, a beaten up old white transit van. Um, and we did all the nightclubs in Ireland. We made about 60 quid a gig each. And we got everything thrown at us, cigarette butts, bottles of beer, pints thrown over us. The lads didn't want it, like being uh, th these Irish guys, they didn't want to have anything to do with this. Because you know, we were just turning up in the, at a nightclub in the middle. So everyone was there having a good time and all of a sudden this band would show up, this boy band, these lads and, and, and dance and sing. And everyone would be laughing at us like, what? You know, who do these lads think they are? But the girls would all be jumping on stage wanting to hug us and kiss us. So the lads wouldn't be into any of this. They'd be like, who the fuck do they think they are? And they'd be trying to hit us. <laughs> I remember one time up in the Glenties in the, in the north of Ireland, in the middle of nowhere, one night of kicking off on stage, and Keith, who's one of the bigger lads in the band, picking me up under one, in one arm and Stephen in the other, and running across the dance floor over to our dressing room, which was on the other side of the, the, the nightclub. And then us having to do a legger into the van, and lads beating, you know, trying to break the glass. It was rough. It was, yeah, you know, it was, it was a baptism of fire. It was amazing. Um, and I don't think a lot of boy bands and girl bands in, in the pop industry, especially with the, the opportunities today, like X Factors and so on, we didn't have any of that. We just kind of made it up as we went along. We didn't have anyone guide us. We didn't have any record company at the time. We didn't have any sort of management at the time. We had a management figure, but he didn't manage the band. He just would find nightclub gigs for us and send us off to do it. And then in the midst of all of this, a, a magazine in the UK called Smash Hits kind of got wind of this Irish pop group and invited us over to do what they call, well, the Smash Hits poll, you know, well, show on the road. It was the Smash Hits tour. And it travelled around the country uh, doing very large venues, arenas in the UK, everywhere. And we were the new act, best show on the road. We went up against two other bands called Deuce and Optimistic. And the winning band of the three bands got to perform at the Docklands Arena on the pole winners party, which was broadcast on ITV to millions around the country. And people like Will Smith hosted it and all the big bands of the time from Take That to Bad Boys Inc. to whoever, E17, everybody performed on this. So you'd really feel that you'd made it. And we won. We bloody won it. And everything just fell into place then. We had an album out, a single out, Love Me For A Reason. Went number two in the UK charts a couple of months later and it all began from there. So you just mentioned all these boy bands that existed at the same time, so just take that and so oh. on. What is it that set you apart from the others? What was your niche as boys in? I think, I think what, we, yeah, what we all felt was we were kind of the working class boy band. We were the type of lads you'd meet on the street. We weren't polished, we weren't great dancers, we weren't even great singers. We were... But <laughs> we were, we were your everyman boy band as such, rough and ready, but not like E17 rough, you know, we were, you know, we were nice lads, you know, we were, you know, approachable, nice lads. And, and I think that was part of the charm. We'd come over and we had these accents, you know, we had Irish accents in the UK. There was, there was something about that that people liked. So when we were on live and kicking and all these different TV shows, it was, it, there was a charm to that. So people allowed us to, you know, invited us on their shows and we performed, the songs were good, catchy, and, and it created momentum and, and, and it just built and built from there. 
Um, and kind of at any point, coming back to how young you were when all of this was happening, did you feel like you'd missed out on having a normal childhood as yeah. such? Yeah, and it's not till later on you realise that. I mean, I was 16, I was the youngest member of the band. Mikey, being the eldest, was five years older than me. He was 21. I was still in school, as was Theo. And at 16 years of age, you know, now today, that's a 16-year-old is very different to a 16-year-old 26 years ago. I should have been climbing trees and cycling my bike and doing the things the kids do, you know, causing a bit of trouble and, and having some fun. Not travelling around like, you know, like I was when we were. Yeah, you, you lose your innocence. You say things innocently in magazines and it's all over the papers and press. And, um, you know, coming from a, a family like I did, my mum was up the wall, my mother was, the things I'd be saying. But I meant it and I, you know, it was innocence. But I didn't expect it to be in the press and the, written about it. You're just talking to a journalist. We didn't get any media training. We didn't have anyone guide us. You know, other bands are all of that, the polished. They get the media training. Nowadays, everything is, is protected, which is great and important. And people get all that media training, which is really important. But, you know, we didn't. So all of our innocence, all of that was taken away because of, well, not all of our innocence, but our, some of our innocence was taken away because of that. Which is sad in a way, but hey, fucking, what can you do? You can't go back. That's that. That's that. Um, so stepping aside from kind of the boy's own journey of your career, in 1999 you recorded a version of When You Say Nothing At All for Notting Hill, yeah. which kind of springboarded your solo career. Um, did you always intend to go solo? Not when I first joined the band. I wanted to be in a band, I wanted to be in boy's own. Uh, but I guess as time goes on and, and you're learning your craft. We learnt our craft as we went along. I mean, we didn't learn it and then join a band. We were, every day, every time I went in the studio and every time I sang, I bettered myself and I learnt more about what I was capable of. I realised, you know, and, and, you know, being in a band that you're, you're kind of, you're, you're put together. I didn't know the guys beforehand. And I took what I did very, very seriously. And sometimes you felt that maybe some people in the band didn't take it as seriously and you become resentful and you think, well, you know, we're all, you know, getting the same here. It's all, you know, but yet you're not given what I'm given. And I, you know, I want to keep this going. I want to do better. I want to be better. I want to, you feel you can only go so far in that situation. So you have to change things. So an opportunity came along. I didn't plan this, but Richard Curtis was making Notting Hill and he asked me to sing the song. He asked me, he didn't ask the band. He didn't think I was gonna go solo, he just asked, would I sing it? He picked me and, and that, that was when everything just kind of fell into place and I sang the song, uh, I put it down and it just went crazy. I mean, it was mad. Uh, from, from the moment it was released, the movie helped the song, the song helped the movie. There's only a few times that kind of thing happens. Brian Adams, everything I do, I do it for you. Wet, 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 love is all around. There's a few movies and songs that just, it just works, it just happens and the song is as famous as the movie and vice versa and it just, it was one of those moments, I got, I got lucky. Richard is very, very good at finding those songs and placing them in the right places in the movies. Um, so I got lucky and it went crazy and, and the record company then came to me and said let's do an album. It was only ever one song and then it became an album and then Eight albums later, I think, or nine or ten, I don't know how many records I've made since, twelve, maybe. Um, and was there anything you missed about being a part of a unit or a band? Yeah, you missed the camaraderie, the friendship. It's like being in, you know, I guess I never went, but it's, I guess it's like being in university. Um, the friends that you make and meet and, and, and the friendships, the sense of humour, the bubble that, you know, as soon as you come back, it's still there, that magic is still there, that, that, that energy is still there. Being in Boy Zone, and you know, we came back together in 2007 and we had, you know, we broke up in October this year, we finally said goodbye. But being in the band makes you young. So as soon as we came back in 2007, I felt like I was 17, 18 years of age again. That sense of humor was there, the camaraderie was there, the friendship was there, and even though we all had our own individual lives, and things we were doing. As soon as we came back and we were all in that dressing room together, it was the same stupid jokes and the same sense of humour and the same, that's, that same banter. It was amazing. 
was there anything that had changed? Had you kind of had your approach towards making music changed when you came back in 2007? Or? Well, it was funny because I came back with the rest of the lads didn't make music like I did for those seven years. So I came back as, as that guy and they came back as those guys and, and it was different. The level, f the, f the, the, the playing field had changed. And I had brought something that I never, I, they never saw before from me to the, to the table. So um, yeah, it had changed, it changed dramatically. Yeah, yeah, at times it was, at, at times it was, yeah. Um, it, was, it was wonderful at times, but it was difficult. My favourite years in the band were 2007 to 2009. Uh, Stephen was alive. We were having a great time. It was, it was a lot of fun. I, 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 was, I wasn't trying to prove myself like I was in the 90s to the band and to as my role in the band. I knew what my role was, I knew who I was. Um, a kind of jockey in for position that you'd have in a band that was gone for me. I'm not saying it wasn't there, it just wasn't there for me because I knew what I could do and what I could bring. So that, so that helped me a lot. So I, I felt comfortable in my own skin. And, and whether that was age or experience, um, it, it, it was a nice place for me to be in. Um, so to ask a bit about kind of Stephen and his um, passing away. How yeah. did that impact you as a person and as an artist both? Yeah, it's been probably been the hardest thing I've ever had to go. I lost my mum uh, when I was 20 years of age and that was very, very difficult, but losing, and I'm still, you know, it's still very hard, but losing Theo at such a young age, when he had so much to give and, and, and you know, we had, you lost touch for a while and came back, and, but we're better friends than we ever were. And we were brothers and we were very close. A lot. For all of us, losing Steel was, we, you just don't fathom stuff like that. You, don't, you, don't, you can't get your head around it. Still can't get my head around that. It's very hard. You, you can still, Keith and I had a, we, we caught up recently and, and had a few drinks together. And the two of us are sitting at the table at four o'clock in the morning over a bottle of wine crying over Stephen. And you find yourself in these situations it's still, you know, it's, it's still very emotional, still very raw. Um, it, it's not fair. Not, not, and that's not on us, on him. He had so much life left. He had so much to give. And how did your music change after experiencing that? I don't know how much the music changes. Your opinion changes. Your, your attitude towards life changes. Your, you want to live every day as if it's your last um <laughs> sorry um you want yeah you want to um you want to just embrace it you embrace it all as best you can and, and enjoy it hug your kids hug your wife and, and be happy and live it you know live your life it's you really do appreciate things differently Turning now to kind of some of your later experiences, you spent five years as a judge on the Australian X Factor, yeah. um, with some success as a mentor. Um, what was this experience like, being transported to a country? It was great, and it was it was tough at the same time. It was it was great to be that side because I'd watched it on TV in the UK and I'd seen it, and, and so I went over there to Australia or down there to Australia and loved the country, loved being there, and getting to see how these sort of shows were produced and made, yeah, it kind of, it's kind of upsetting as an artist. And you don't want to be produced. You don't want to be told what to say. You don't want to be told what to do in that regard. You want, you know, if you want me there because of who I am, well then allow me to bring that. But as Simon Cowell says himself, it's an entertainment show, not a talent show. And it's about entertainment. And, and when you, when you realise that, then you embrace it and you, you do what you have to do on the show. But I think being in, doing that show in Australia, that kind of allowed us a little more to just do what we needed to do and wanted to do. So, I, you know, on, in the first season, maybe in the first few weeks, I said a few things about people because the producer said, oh, you should say this. And I remember meeting some fella on the street in Sydney and he said, why did you say that? And I thought, you're right. You know, I failed. You know, what, you know what, what am I doing listening to them? And I thought, why, why did I do that? And I felt I failed the people who were watching the show and I failed the artist. So I went back on the show and I, I just told the truth from then on in. And it was amazing how the country embraced that. And, and, and I've had a relationship with Australia now. I'm married to an Australian woman. But it's, it's, you know, this, 
I understand them, I get them, and I know who they are and what they're about, and they're great people. I've loved it, they've been great years for me. I've really enjoyed being on the show. I went and did a year on The Voice after that, after those five years in the UK, in, in Australia also. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was just a different set of tools, I guess, a different, different set of rules, um, but the same, same thing. Um, so, quickly, just to talk about your career beyond music, um, you have participated in and led a wide range of charitable activities, including um, the Marie Keating Foundation that you set up in mm. memory of your mother. Could you talk about this work and what exactly it is that you aim to change about the society around you and so on? Well, as I said earlier, my mum died when I was 20. I was very young. Um, my mum was only 51 years of age. She's a young woman. I mean, I'm 42, so I have nine years left, right? That's it, if, if I'm going to be the same age, past the same. That, it's just too young. I have so much to give. She had so much to give. And she was an incredible woman. Five kids. Loved her. She made us the people we are. I mean, she was an amazing woman. So f it was very, very difficult for us to first, firstly realize, find out that she had cancer and the two years then she went through it to deal with all of that and then to lose her uh, was very hard for us. We, we, we were very bitter, very angry. Um, so with all of that negativity, I think it was my sister Linda who said, let's do something about it. You've got profile, I've got the ability to be behind the scenes and work it. Let's, let's do something. Let's allow people to not be in the position that we were in when, when firstly we found out mom had cancer and secondly when she passed. I mean, we, we were naive, we were ignorant to the disease. We educated ourselves very quickly, but we found out that mom, my, our mom died of, of, of the most curable form of cancer. She came from a generation that wouldn't go to the doctor and get the breast checked, like those lads who won't go to the doctor and get our testicles checked or whatever else, because it's too embarrassing, which is just stupid. But, you know, we live in a world now where there's, you know, all this stuff around us, radiation and stuff in the foods and chemicals and everything, that there's, there's more around us now than ever affecting us and giving us this disease. But medicine today is better than it's ever been. So your mom came, mom came, you know, died from a disease that, you know, if she had went to the doctor, she could have went through therapy, chemotherapy and so on, and, 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 and still be alive today. And that makes, that made us very, very angry. So basically we set up the Marie Keating Foundation so that other people wouldn't be in that situation. Early detection is your best chance of survival. So it's all about the message, understanding, check yourself regularly. Um, and when you find something, how to deal with that. That's our message. That's what we do at the Marie Keaton Foundation. Free service, drive around the country. We've got three mobile units that drive around, oncology nurses on board, people go on board, they speak to the nurses and they, they get information because it's, as you all know, it's, it's key. It's king. Uh, and then Cancer Research UK liked our model and they came to us and they said, we'd like to do the same here in the UK. So we now have three 40 foot trucks that drive around the country. Um, going to areas that don't have clinics, etc., with oncology nurses on board. People step on and, and they get all the information, fake prosthesis to check whether it's a testicle or a, or a breast or whatever it is. And if they find something, then we fast track them to a, lo you know, a specialist and so on. And, and that's it, that's what it is. That's, it's a very, very basic thing. In, in, in we've now moved into the, in the, in the curriculum in Ireland in s second form. Uh, teenagers are now learning about cancer through the Marie Keating Foundation. We, you know, we give all the information, all the paperwork, all everything in the schools, um, which is very, very proud as a family. To, you know, kids are learning about cancer through our mum's name, the Marie Keating Foundation. Um, but it's still very sad, very difficult that you know we've got our ball in two weeks' time here in London, at the Emeralds and Ivy Ball. We're continually fundraising, whatever it may be walking across Ireland or swimming across seas or whatever we, what we've done over the years. You've got to find ways to, one, raise money to keep all of these things going, but two, raise awareness. Keep the message going. People get lackadaisy, people forget. They move on to something else, Instagram or Twitter. They forget the message, forget to check themselves. You've got to keep drilling it into people. And do you think that all this amazing productive work that you've done in memory of your mother has helped you process the loss? I've still lost my mum. And that's not fair, it's not right. But I'm not alone. There's millions of children 
and millions of parents who have lost children because of the disease. So I'm not the only one, um, but I'm somebody who has been able to use my position to help other people. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to be able to do that so that I can find some sort of solace, is whatever the word is, to, in, in you know, mum's passing. Just one final question for me before we take questions from the yeah. audience. Um, what is it that the future holds for you? Is it more, more charity work, music? Yeah, I've got a new, I'm working on a new album right now, uh, which is coming out in March. First single is out in February. It's a duet with a, a well-known female artist here in the UK. It's kind of a 20 year, it's, I've been 20 years solo now, so I've re-recorded some of the old songs, um, which is, has been, it's actually amazing. I just did a vocal on, on, uh, on When You Say Nothing At All, which is my oldest original, uh, my oldest solo track. And, and it's, I thought to myself, there's not a lot of people who get to go back and re-record their songs. And uh, I have an opportunity to put them on a new album. 20 odd years, my voice has changed so much in 20 years. When I listen to that original recording of When You Said Nothing At All, it sounds like a different person. And I feel really lucky that I'm in a position I can go back into a, a beautiful studio with brilliant microphones, you know, and a great producer and engineer, Steve Lipson, who did it originally 20 years ago, and have the opportunity to do it again. I think it's a real privilege. It's really, it's, it's an amazing position to be in. So I'm very excited for everyone to hear that because I think I'm better now than I was back then. I hope I am. People might not like it, but I think I am. Yeah. Okay, so we can now take questions from the audience. If you have a question, put your hand up and a microphone should come straight to you. Um, if we go to the hand in the third row in the navy jumper, oh, yeah. please. If you could put your hand up again. And if you could stand up while asking your questions, that'd be yeah. very good. Thank you. Hi. All right. Hi, um, so you said um, you thought you were going to be a, a sprinter. Yeah. Um, and then you, you obviously got into this when you were 16 and you've got the, the charity and things like that now, but you've, you've only ever known music. I was just wondering if you had to choose, what else would you do? Like, not, not, not like if you lost it all, but if, if it never happens, what, what would you be doing? It's just scary, isn't it? When you think, uh, you know, it's hard. All my brothers and sister, they emigrated to New York. <laughs> Um, because there was no, unemployment was at an all time high in Ireland at the time. And in the late 80s, there was this, you know, sadly, uh, you know, this constant flow of young people moving to America to find opportunity. So they all moved to America. I was the only one after this big family, you know, five brothers and sister, sisters at home. Um, all of a sudden I was the only one left at home. and. They all did well for themselves in New York, and I think I probably would have followed suit. I probably would have went to New York, and well, if I wasn't gonna be a runner, I mean, I would have, God knows. I, I, look, I was always a bit of a performer, I think, you know, I, but probably like everyone else who's into it, at Christmas times, in front of the fireplace, singing songs and dancing for your mom and dad, or when the aunties and uncles come over, and putting on a show with your, you know, with your cousins and stuff. I was always a bit of a performer, but I never thought younger that I was going to be a singer, you know. Like, there's loads of great singers, better singers than me out there, loads. I got lucky. I was in the right room at the right place at the right time. I probably, end, I probably would have been in New York. I probably would have been working in a bar, in an Irish bar. God knows. <laughs> yeah, God knows. But, yeah, I mean, look, what you get you, lucky. What would you choose to do? That, that's kind of what. Like, what would I choose to what do? What would you choose to, if not music, what would you choose to do? Oh. And not, maybe not the charity either, because obviously you, you, you got to do that. But just what, what would you choose to do? I've never had to think about it. I don't know. I don't know what I would have choose to do. I chosen, I would have obviously finished school um, because I left school in its last year, in, in my last year to join the band. I, I was given an ultimatum, the band or school. And of course I chose the band. I, I, I remember sitting with my mum saying, mum, can I leave? She said, yeah, as long as you promise me if it fails, you go back. So I, was, I got lucky. I haven't had to go back yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> still happen. Uh, but yeah, I, look, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't very academic in school. I wasn't very, I, I, I couldn't, I found it hard to comprehend, to listen, to pay attention. 
was a bit of a dreamer, doodling on the back of my books and, and listening to music and playing football and sprinting. And, um, but I, I enjoyed English and I thought, you know, I always enjoyed poetry and English and stuff and, you know, I, the arts as such. So maybe I would have, acting maybe would have, it, it's on my radar still. I've made a couple of films and, you know, it is something that I enjoy. Maybe that would have been something I've fallen into or if I'd went to New York, maybe that would, I would have chosen to go further, further west and, you know, follow that dream that so many others, uh, you know, are still following out there. Maybe. Thanks, man. Thank you. If we go to the hand in the front row, just over here. Um, so, how did your bandmates react when they found out that you were having the solo song and then went on to your solo Well, we, we had all agreed that we were going to take a break from the band. Everybody had had enough. After six years of a pressure cooker, that boy's own is, or any band is, it was so intense. I think we all wanted a break from it. Because we spent six years traveling. We spent no time at home, really. Most of the time was in Asia, Australia, Europe, on planes constantly, on, you know, in hotels, in a studio, always, always traveling. Um, and in, 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 in each other's lives and each other's pockets. So we were all relieved when we all decided. I remember we made the decision, we were in Amsterdam, we were doing a record company, we had a record company event, it was a launch of an album, and we decided that night that we all, did, we all talked and we, we were gonna take a break. And it, that was, the, the wheels were in motion then. That break led to a breakup that was longer than we had planned. And I, I'm, I was responsible for the band not coming back together again because I was on a high. I was, you know, traveling, doing my thing you know, touring, making records. And, you know, the pressure that was on me from the label to continue to do that, I couldn't just walk away from it. I had signed a contract. I had to make three album or four, whatever contract it was at the time. And, and so it wasn't that easy. And I liked it. You know, the truth is I like being solo. Um, and then the time was right. We came back in 2007. But yeah, I mean, at the time, everyone was fine about it. But yeah, not, maybe not so much after a while. If we go to the hand, just here. So thanks again for coming to speak to us this evening. Thank um, you. Just thinking back to your touring days, you had the solo role with the band. Were there any cities or venues that really stick out for you that were like really memorable occasions for you to play? Yeah, that was a, there was a lot of moments. I mean, we, we were really blessed with the situations. You know, we started out on the Smash Hits tour, as I said, and I remember turning up in these arenas like Whitley Bay ice rink in the middle of nowhere, if, if you ask me, but I'm, I'm sure it isn't. But at the time when I was a kid, I, was, I felt a million miles away from home. Um, I remember Ant and Deck, were, PJ and Duncan, they were called at the time, were the big act because they were Newcastle boys. Um, but we try, yeah, we, Glasgow has always been a place. The energy there, there's a certain energy in Glasgow, uh, from, you know, when you stand on stage, they're a bit crazy, I guess. And, and that's brilliant when you're in a room and you're on stage with these guys there. They were amazing. They'd lift you, they'd carry you. But then there's moments like standing on stage with Pavarotti or Elton John. You know, when I stood beside Pavarotti in Modena and sang those songs with them, I remember looking to my right thinking, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> you know, it was, it's crazy. We, I don't think he stands there and says, how the hell did I get here? You know, but I, I definitely felt I was, Jesus, this kid, working class kid from the wrong side of the tracks in Dublin, standing on stage in Italy in Modena with Pavarotti. I mean, what? It's mad. It was crazy. And then Madison Square Garden with Elton. Pinch myself. It was crazy. And, and there's people like Brian Adams and Mary J. Blige and Billy Joel on stage. And Ronan Keaton, what's he doing here? You know, I'm, it's, it's mad. But... And you know what, I don't, I think, I think it's probably important to hold on to a bit of that because it keeps your feet on the ground, you don't lose the run of yourself. And I think that going back to that question earlier about what made Boys Own different, maybe because we did have our feet on the ground, we weren't rude, we weren't obnoxious pop stars and we didn't have these crazy riders or security bodyguards around us and all these things. We were, you know, we were approachable. Um, which helped. But yeah, I, you know, there's very, very different atmospheres. You go out to Asia, we, we went to Asia, and Boys Own, it was like the Beatles, I imagine. I wasn't around then, but we, we, got, we got to Indonesia, uh, Jakarta, and I remember landing, and the army had to come out to the plane because there were so many people in the terminal. And 
they took us off the plane and brought us into the terminal and they, they had to put us in the toilets because they had broken into the, where the baggage carousels are. So the, and there's a photograph, there's a, this dude was photographing us at the time and he, was, he, he made a book, but there's a photograph of us standing by the urinals with all the army around us in, in a toilet in Jakarta. And then we were escorted through and it was, it was, it was actually scary because you fear for your life. Everybody's just, they're, they're lovely and they're just trying to touch you or get, but you fear for your life. You think th this could all go wrong at, at any moment. Um, so there was like, for a moment, there was a real moment in Boyzone, it was probably around 98, 97, 98, when things got really crazy. And I think Take That had called it a day. And at that time, for a minute, we were probably the biggest boy band in the world. Um, no matter what, was this big number one record everywhere. And, and, and it, it was pretty special to be part of that, to be part of all of that. But yet, the five of us were just doing our thing. We were the same five lads, just you know, making it up as we went along. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, a, you know, it was, it was a real moment. Yeah, thanks, thanks, man. If we go to the left, then the grey jumper. Hi, Ronan. Um, Hi. Can you tell us a bit more about how your voice has changed and how um, it affects the way you choose melodies or just enjoy singing in general? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't see myself as a very strong singer when I was 16, but I knew I loved to sing. And, you know, I, I was in school bands, rock, you know, cover, we did Nirvana covers and all this kind of stuff, and I, I used to enjoy the performance. But I remember the audition for Boys On. They asked us to all sing Curlis Whisper by George Michael. And that is not an easy song to sing. Uh, you know, it might sound it when you listen to George because he was so good. So I said, I'm going to be clever here. I'm going to ask to sing a different song. So I turned up with Father and Son, which is a much easier song. Uh, well, maybe easier is the wrong. It's a song that suits my voice better than Curlis Whisper. And they allowed me to do that. And it was that moment, I think, that, you know, making a decision like that, that really, that was, that was it. That got me in the band. And it was up to me then to, to be a better singer. And the first time we went into the studio, we were with this producer. His name was Ian Levine. And we were all individually going in and out of the studio. And our then manager was a guy called Louis Walsh. Uh, uh, Ian Levine said to him, get rid of the blonde one, he can't sing. And Louis said this to me, and rather than me get upset about it, and luckily Louis didn't throw me out of the band, but I thought to myself, I'm going to prove him wrong. And that was my moment, that was a defining moment in my career right there. Because I, I decided, yeah, okay, maybe he's right, so I have to be better. And I just tried to be the best singer I could be. And I, I'm not the best singer in the world, but I have characters, characteristics in my voice that some people like, and that it has allowed me to, to continue to do it. And I have worked on that constantly. The more you sing, the better you get. There's no doubt about that. And then opportunities along the way. I, I did a show called Once in the West End in London for four months. Never thought I would do a musical. That was always Stephen's thing. But it was this one show, I don't know if you've ever seen the film or the, or the show uh, in the West End, but it's magic. It's, it's a play with these brilliant songs that you'd hear on the radio. It's not all that jazz hand musical stuff that I don't really you know, do or it's not my bag. So I loved it and I thought, yeah, I'll do it. And it was also being produced by Barbara Broccoli who makes James Bond, so I thought, Jesus, I better do it. Um, so um, I went and did that show and I learned so much about myself as a singer as a performer in, in that, in performing without microphones on a stage where you have to project. I learned so much about myself as a singer in those four months. It was so brilliant. And I owe so much to that, to those four months. I, I loved every minute, every single performance. I bettered myself as a guitar player, as a singer, as a performer. But it is, my voice has changed when I listen back to, to a nasally uh, vocal when I was you know, 17, 18, 19, I have tried to, to move away from that and better myself as a singer to, to today. And it was interesting doing the vocal for When You Say Nothing At All just this week and, and referencing the old one constantly 
Steve would play me the old line and then I'd listen, or the old verse and I'd listen. And then I, because I've sung When You Say Nothing at all thousands of times since that first performance, and I've changed melody lines and I've changed words, I've changed so much that I had to reference and listen to it. Because you make things your own as, singer, as a singer. Uh, over time you change. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been a real breath of fresh air and I'm really looking forward to everybody else hearing hearing my voice now on that song to how it was 20, uh, 20 years ago. I hope that answers your question. I, thought I went on a bit of a ramble there. Sorry. Thanks. If we go to the, in the second row at the end. Hi there. Hey, yeah. um, you do the, um, uh, the breakfast show on Magic on yes. um, week, week, weekday mornings. Can you talk about um, how that opportunity uh, came up first? Yeah. Uh, and, and then maybe uh, a bit uh, about how you balance that breakfast show commitment with other things that you do in your life, because clearly uh, you, you have lots of other things going on. You've done shows from different parts of the world. Yeah. So yeah. I'd, be, I'd, I'd be quite interested to know a bit more about that. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've, I'm two years on Magic Breakfast now. Um, I never thought I was going to do radio. You never think you're going to do anything, I suppose. It's just the same thing until these things come your way. I, Magic would ask me, invite me on to do a one show on a Sunday or, <clears throat> and they do that, you know, Will Young might do a show here or there, Rick Astley did a show. You know, the artists that are, you know, I guess Magic artists get invited to do their own shows, the odd random show. So I did quite a few of them and I liked it and I get on well with the team. And we, we, in the music industry, it's changed so dramatically, you know, in the 26 years since I started, there was no such thing as the internet. There was no, none of that. There was, you know, cassettes, uh, CDs, all the things that we all know, most of us out here, um, record stores. And now that is gone. I mean, it's gone. It's, it's such a small percentage of, you know, record sales and so on, that we have to find other ways to promote our music and what we do. Whether it's a TV show, a radio show, you know, some of us use social media, whatever it may be. And radio is still a very, very powerful medium. Every morning you're in people's showers, bathrooms, kitchens, cars, you know, the ra we listen to radio in, in the morning, wherever we're going whatever we're doing. And so I thought to myself, this is, this is a great way for me to stay relevant. Because it's hard to constantly do that with your music. Um, and to do that all of the time, it's exhausting almost. You can't, you can't keep up. And there's a flood of artists, there's so much. And you, you can't be Justin Bieber forever. Like someone will replace Justin Bieber soon. You know, he's getting older and, and he's not gonna do what he did as much as he did it. People are going to, you know, all the kids were big fans. They're going to grow up too and they're not going to be as passionate about them. And then there'll be someone else. And those kids will lock on to those, you know, to their, art, their favourite artists. So it's, it's, it's a cycle constantly. So I've, I've kind of moved out of that area now where it's, you know, people run down the road after me and screaming my name. I'm, that, do, that doesn't happen anymore. So you've got to find other ways, you know, you know to stay relevant and, and to stay in people's heads and hearts. So radio for me was, was a was a decision I made. I thought, this is what I'm gonna do. And my management, this is, these are conversations we had. This is, this is a move we're gonna make. We're gonna do this. As well as make music, we're gonna, we're gonna do radio. I love working on Magic. I love the people, I love the station, I love the, the, everyone behind the scenes as well. They're a great bunch of people, they're good people. Uh, I like the music, my music, Boy Zone's music, all the boy bands and girl bands that we play. It's my, it's my type of music, so it was a good fit. And it's been amazing. Our ratings have gone through the roof over the two years. More people have listened to Magic than they ever have before. Um, and more people stop me on the street now and ask me about competitions we have on Magic than they do about the music, which is kind of weird. <laughs> you know, or you know, whose voice is that in the, you know, or you know, what envelope is the, the 100K in or whatever it may be. It's madness, but yeah, so it, like it works. And when it comes to a situation then where I have a record out, well, Magic, you know, do what I need them to do and I do what they need me to do. So it's, it's a great relationship and it works and I enjoy it. I didn't think I'd be here two years later. I thought it was, a, it was something I do for a small amount of time and I enjoy it. I hate going to bed early. I hate getting up at 5 a.m. It's not nice, but once I'm on there, I love it. I bloody love it. And, and I travel a lot still, so 
you know, I do shows. I was on tour. We did China and Japan and across Asia. I did some shows from there, and, and it's it brings a, a different element to the show. It's fun. It's not always easy when the Wi-Fi is crap um, and, and there's a delay, and it, it you know it, it all goes a bit skew if, but. It, it works, it's kind of nice that I, I still have that and in my head I'm still that artist and a performer but yet I can come back and be a sidekick with, with Harriet or whatever, you know, whatever we do. So it's a lot of fun, I enjoy it and, and, and I hope, you know, people enjoy listening to it too. Um, I should say it's a fantastic show by the way. Thanks so. man, thank you very much, I appreciate that, thank you. Uh, nice to hear. Great, yes, just in the, in the second row. So third, third row. Hi. Are there any signs um, that your children are going to follow in your footsteps? Yeah, oh, my daughter's, um, she's made a, a couple of films, Missy, my older daughter, 18, um, independent films. She's, she's studying drama at the moment in, in London. She loves music, she plays guitar, she sings, she loves acting. I don't think she's found her feet exactly what she wants to do yet, but I, it, in the performing arts, I definitely believe Missy will, will do that. Jack loves his rugby and, and my, other, my younger daughter loves horses and then Cooper, who knows, he's two. He's just driving me up the wall at the minute, but he's brilliant, he's a, he's a, he's a little performer, all right, that fella. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think Missy will and, and I would embrace that if, you know, if she wants to do it, yes, I'll guide her and help her. It is a, an amazing industry to be in, um, as long as you have people that are around you that will protect you. It's very dangerous, like any game, I guess. Um, and there are pitfalls, there are, there are a lot of negative, not a lot of negatives, but a lot of positives in the game. Um, so I think, you know, I think it is a wonderful industry to be in, but you've got to protect, you've got to be protected. Yeah, thank you. If we go to the hand, just yeah. right the back. Yeah, man. Thanks very much for coming down today, Ronan. Thank you very much, thanks. Um, I was just going to ask you, so back when you were younger, you said that George Michael and Wham were big influences. Yeah. As you've kind of grown and been exposed to different things through the mu music industry, have your influences changed or is there anything that you've kind of picked up along the way? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, new artists have definitely come into the fold that I admire from John Mayer or... Um, yeah, like, who, I mean, Irish artists like, um, you know, there's lots. I'm trying to pick one that like, Damien Rice, you know, they're you know they're artists that I admire and listen to a lot. But George George's music still today is, you know, the most important music in my life. You know, I had just really admired him as a singer, as an artist, uh, as a, a creative mind he was incredible um, we lost him too soon he, he became a friend I was very lucky to call him a friend and we spent a lot of time together I learned a lot from him um, so I think from that I think that made it even more so important his music to me uh, the lessons that I learned from him and, and, and you know, bettering myself as a writer as a, as a singer I learned that from George I think a lot um, and he was a perfectionist you know, he was a perfectionist and there are times where I fail as a perfectionist because we need to be as artists. You need to go back to the drawing board over and over and over again. Um, I learned from him that I need to push it more. Where I got lazy, he would teach me to push more um, and be better and, and go back and question it again and again and again. Still today I do it, I get lazy and I hear him because that's what he did all the time. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think... Um, yeah, there's lots of great artists, loads. But sadly, you look now and who, who's going to be the future Elton John or George Michael or Freddie Mercury or Bono? There's not a lot. We've, you know, the market's flooded with lots of good people, but not really great people. Um, we have great, great artists like Ed Sheeran. But there's, there's, like, I mean, there's not many others like him. So it is... It is it's kind of sad and scary, you wonder, you wonder. Yeah, but he's still, you know, he's, it's still very important to me, George's music. Um, and I, I love to listen to all the charts and everything that's going on musically. Um, all the different singers, you know, that come and go. Um, but you can spot the ones that are going to last. Thanks, man. I 
think, unfortunately, that is all we have time oh, for today. Okay, that's um, fine, boy. That's yeah, fun. I think it's, yeah. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking. Thank you Very so much for coming out. <laughs>